Thank you very much for so many of you joining. More than usually when I'm in an election. So I'm delighted to see so many people here. So I offer my apologies for being late. And you can see sometimes the things don't go quite right for me. And I'm <coughs> screaming and shouting. So again, what do you expect? from a man who was a waiter for 10 years of his life. I've never got used to the kind of solidarity that one should have in keeping calm. So, first of all, thank you very much for coming. I'm delighted to be talking about climate change. I spent most of my life dealing in climate change. And certainly since 1975, uh, when we went to Kyoto, and in fact, that's what I want to talk to today. So I'm honored to give an address to this very important conference to discuss global economic governance and common development. I say that because I currently believe that from my experience and what I'm going to give you tonight about the global environment challenge is a politician's negotiation view of what went on. My perspective over that period since 1997. I say that because I currently believe, from that experience, there's no guarantee that the existing global governance arrangements can secure an acceptance, common development, that will deliver in all parts of the world. We are now talking global, and that's the point I want to make tonight. Indeed, this widening of the growing economic and social disparities between the high-income countries and the low-income countries is growing in an unacceptable and unsustainable way. What I want to lay out today is my belief that the key global challenges of our, our age, tackling world poverty, common economic growth, achieving the lasting solution to climate change, they are inextricably linked. They are two sides of the same coin. You cannot affect one without affecting the other. And how you get them in balance is the challenge for what we're talking about, global solutions to global problems. I'm convinced all the more of that since my negotiations since 1997 with the Kyoto Formula and the conference of the parties that have taken place, of which the next one here is in Morocco, of course, in a couple of weeks' time, so I'll be coming back yet again uh, to enjoy the hospitality, but more important, the importance of arriving at the right decisions for the global solutions for global, global problems. We need to achieve a new global consensus because you cannot get an agreement without consensus and how we secure sustainable economic growth. And I know that's your concern as well as every country. Not only how do you get the growth, but how do you do it in a sustainable way? And I know that's your interest, and I want to uh, address myself to the workable solutions to achieve that. Now, the Kyoto Protocol is where it largely started with, and that's Protocol 1 at Kyoto. In fact, of course, China has moved on quite considerably, and I've visited China, China over 30 times, so I understand exactly where they're coming from. But they're not the same as all developing countries. They're not all at that stage of development, and I want to bring that to your attention. I became the chief negotiator the first month of a new Labour government under Tony Blair. That was in 1997. Simply because President Clinton rang, and you know a close relationship with Tony Blair at that time, it was before the Bush came in, uh, and Prime Minister Tony Blair, and he asked him for a tough European negotiator for Kyoto. He said, well, I've got John Prescott here, he's one of our ministers, and indeed he was a trade union negotiator, always involved in strikes, so I assume he must be tough. He needs to recognize a change in global situation requires a great consensus of agreement between the developed and the developing countries, usually known as the Group 66 and then the, the 47 industrial countries. There were two groups that were key out there, one. It also needs to recognize that developing nations in their early stages of industrialization have a right to a process to the right of economic growth. And inevitably that means in their access for energy, it's usually coal or oil, and they're the high carbon production system of which the rich country poisoned the rest of the world with the production of carbon too. So basically we have to make some of the facts right. 
It also needs to recognize that developing nations in their early stages of industrialization have a right to process their rate of growth at a faster rate than the developing countries. That's as they go through the early stages of industrialization, one recognizes that. To reach greater prosperity and greater equality in national pro uh, prosperity and growth. Change is the biggest threat to global sustainable development. And it's vital to recognize that we're all in this together, east, west, north, south. In response to this judgment, we began to tackle the issue internationally 30, 20 years ago at Kyoto and make a speech, right? And then I've got to tell you, international negotiations, which had to decide this consensus, is not one that rationally arrived at. It's negotiations by exhaustion. Because at Kyoto, as we'd come to an agreement to reduce the global 5%, we began to say in cut in CO2, two hours before the close of the conference, and the hall had to be closed because there was a wedding in Japan. And all the world had to be kicked out so these two people could be married. I understand the importance to them, but it's hardly the ruddy way to build uh, negotiations. So I had two hours before we're kicked out of the room to try and get a bigger than 5% cut in carbon for the global figure. And so I had to ring, uh, in this case, Al Gore, who was the vice president. We were working together. And um, the Japanese uh, uh, negotiator, and I sat in the room and I said, look, we've got to get another couple of percent more on this global change. And we've only got an hour. So the Japanese said, well, we'll go up to six, provided it's lower than America. The Americans said, well, we'll go to seven, as long as it's lower than Europe. And I said, oh, if I've got to take the case of an eight, then that's how we ended up five, six, eight. Five, six, seven, eight. What's interesting, it went back to the hall, and the delegates were so exhausted in their chairs, wondering whether they could catch the last plane they'd been looking up for the last two days. And that was passed without a vote. Because as soon as he said the agreement, they're all dashing off for the letter plates. I don't mind how it happens, but I have to tell you, future negotiations have to much, much more effectively and much more rationally in coming at a decision. Like you do in the universities, I'm sure it's more rational. It's all kind of yeah. Media head in terms of right. So to that extent, I just wanted to give you that little story, really. Uh, so the acceptance of the global limit, which everybody agrees that has to be by the reduction of the carbon gas, we have, well, scientists have told us how far we can go. They say a level of what they call no more than 400 parts per million of uh, carbon gas. Actually, we have almost reached that now. They've said you can possibly go to 450 if you to pro limit the rise in temperature from which all the problems come by, by 450. So we're near to the end. And that is difficult because it's beginning to rise even now. And the question whether you can limit it almost down to zero by 2050 looks highly unlikely as it is at the moment unless particular measures are made to come together and achieve that in a more effective uh, then. It's estimated the global ceiling is about 450. I've said and we're at 400 now, so you can see the difficulties of it. The 1970 Kyoto Protocol was the first step towards a global solution to what is a global problem on limiting climate change, and the science now is even clearer than it was in 1997. Well, we were fighting in 1997, everybody was against us, market, oil companies, steel companies, motor car companies, all of them, energy companies, bitterly opposing the science. I think 20 years on now, there isn't a doubt about the science. The doubt is about how you can limit the growth of carbon too, if you want to get, and in a sustainable way for the economy. And everybody is affected by it, by different ways. Richer people aren't quite as affected as poorer people because of the consequences of the society working. So we have to get all the world to agree in a global agreement, and that was the recent Paris Agreement, which I'll talk about in a second. So the Kevin, the uh, Kyoto Protocol was ratified in 2002, 
and was successful in establishing a, re a regime of national targets. So each nation was to accept a target. That was the same at Kyoto 1 as it now is at Kyoto 2, which is basically the Paris Agreement in 2016. But of course, Kyoto 1 only affected 47 countries. They were the industrial countries. They were the ones that they were really polluting the world, and they had to show their credibility to show they could begin to limit it, as they were the greatest producers of carbon too. So it was a matter of credibility for the developing countries to do that. There was no obligation based on developing countries, because that was the first stage, only the 47 uh, richer countries. In the UK, for example, well, we were given our target, we introduced a unique statutory climate change act. We put into law how you have to achieve the targets that you told the world that you were going to do. And that's what we did in 2008. Even the Paris Agreement has not gone that far. We have written into our legislation, it is a matter of law, that what we have set ourselves to achieve as a reduction in carbon will apply and be, can be enforced in the courts. No other country has done that. We've done it uniquely. I hope we could have got it from Paris in 2016, but no, they've only gone so far to say targets, but they haven't laid out yet what the, how you achieve it. And that's what's been so important at the next conference of the parties, which they call it, which is taking place here in Marrakesh in a couple of weeks' time, and which are all back at that time. We want to see now, have these governments who've committed themselves to targets, have they brought in the policies to achieve it? It's so easy at Paris when you're all getting together and having a clap or put your hands in the air to say, we've we are victory. You've found nothing until you produce the policies and begin to implement them and do it over a period from 2020, 2030, 2050. That's the challenge for us now if we want a kind of global agreement. So in that sense, what we did in Britain, we put it into law. The industries were required to meet those requirements. We set targets for different parts of our industry. We did it for the energy industry on what we call the climate change, uh, climate change levy. We charged the big industrialized people who huge use energy, uh, tremendous energy. We said, you'll pay a levy if you don't meet the targets that you agree with us. And what happened then? The industries met those targets. And what's curious then? Well, how did they do it? Because they used energy much more efficiently. They didn't bother before. They took that as a cost and they just paid it. Now they were faced with a penalty. If they didn't reduce the carbon, use more efficient ways of doing it, then you have to pay the penalty. Or if you didn't, you didn't pay the penalty. All of a sudden, the price mechanism in my country was beginning to have an effect on the efficiencies of industry. That meant it was a win-win situation. We achieved what we needed to have with meeting our targets, and the industry itself then found it was more efficient to use energy more efficiently. They didn't pay the levy, but they got a more efficient use of energy. That is probably one of the biggest challenges. Now, we use our law to achieve that. It's constantly used, particularly as we started off with Clinton, then it came to Bush. He's a disaster. But anyway, the Bush administration then said they didn't believe the science, so we're not going to do it. And what they said is that, um, what they said, that if you do this, it'll cost us in jobs, it'll cost greater uh, inefficiencies, bad for the environment. And we don't believe the science anyway. Typical American argument, I think, at that time. But if you look what happened in Britain between 2000 and uh, between 1997 and 2007, where we implemented a framework, the result was we re uh, said our target was to reduce by about 12% in the uh, carbon. Concern of the economics of climate change, we tend to think of the gas, the basket of gases, is what we're concerned about. How do we reduce the carbon? It's the economic consequences if you don't do that which you've got to take into account. So we were concerned with this that we asked the man called Lord Nicholas Stern to produce a report on the economics of climate change. It's a superb book. If you get a chance to read it, you should do it. It certainly uh, uh, influenced me. In it, he focused on the consequences of the failure if you don't do it uh, and to, in order to achieve a sustainable development. He then estimated, and this is fantastic, the world economy will grow between three and four times larger than today by 2050. Three and four times, that's the growth, that's an estimate of the economy. 
He then went on to say that carbon emissions will need to be reduced at least a quarter of what they are today. Can you imagine that now? Talking about a economy that's working basically on business as usual, a matter that you will have to face here in Morocco when you set for the target, do we continue the same way? In fact, you've gone as far to say, yes, we know how we have to reduce carbon, you've even estimated what it might cost against business as usual. I would congratulate you beginning to think now to say if we continue along this road with business as usual, then it will have dramatic effects for us. So you've accepted the argument in Morocco, we must weigh the way forward. And I want to talk about something in that set. will lead to greater demands for cars and technology. You will have noticed it here, I've noticed it this afternoon, I've never seen so many roundabouts in my life, but even though it's high. If you see the amount of <laughs> approaching these roundabouts, the amount of cars, every country has got a considerable amount of growth in cars. It's part of the prosperity, it's part of the pride. No, but it's not just what kind of car you've got, etc. But basically the growth means you produce more carbon. And that is the one thing, the car and the transport industry is one of the effects that has to meet the changes in carbon. Now that might be an electric car or a vehicle, it might be all sorts of things. But what we did estimate, it would not be, we all thought, ah, that's good, we've now done that. But we ignored the gas of diesels, not it. What the diesel car is doing now, we never recognised at Kyoto 1, because carbon was more important. Now we're finding that diesel is killing more people than the use of diesel in motor cars is actually killing more people than the carbon. So you're beginning to see that what we learn as a solution to begin with might have been right in 1997 and the scientists backed it. If you look, it's ongoing. And what we did then is not an acceptable proposition anymore. So the emission targets, whatever it's in, are essential. But there's another essential detail here, and it's part of the United Nations Agreement. That if you have a comparison for us to be able to share carbon, it has to be per capita. Look, in Copenhagen, the deal to bring in uh, Kyoto 2, actually in about 1998, uh, 2008, it failed, it almost failed, because the Americans came along with the view, a man called Mr. Stern, not the same same I was talking to about before, and said, look, to China, both of us are producing the same amount of 20% to 5% CO2 as we do each other, so why don't we now just agree that we'll just reduce it 10%? Well, of course, when you start measuring it per capita, and look at the population in America, and then the one that be a billion more people in China, then what you see is the carbon, if you take it on fairness, per capita becomes an essential issue. In that, the UN laid it down that these negotiations must be common problem uh, how you deal with these matters and how you measure that carbon. The limit of per capita emission estimated the 9 million people in 2050 is 2 tons per capita. Yet the current average of global per capita of the day is 6 and 7 billion population is approximately 8 tons. We're well over what should be the average of a population growth and what should be per capita in the production of CO2. So already the UN has laid down that that must be an acceleration that the production of CO2 nationally considered is different on a per capita basis. This is quite a crucial part. For example, in the United States, Austria and Canada, our average emissions are 20 tons per capita. The EU and Japan, uh, Japan 10 and 12 tons per capita in 1997. China was only 5 then, India 2 and North Africa less than one ton. And you can see why they're there, because they don't have the same kind of industrial uh, development in their industries producing carbon, so it's a massive difference if you're going to try a fairness of dealing with actually the cuts back in copper in, in that. And that for it is a very uh, important area. A global consens consensus uh, sustainability agreement is required. When I began, I said the issue of sustainable economic growth and tackling climate change are inextricably linked. They are two sides of the same coin. You can't act on one without acting on the other. Climate change and energy are all two sides of the same coin. You need not to act on one to the other. What I'm introducing now 
that if you're going to have some kind of rationing of CO2, you better do it in a fair way that's acceptable to every nation. Now, that's a pretty big problem. Simply when the rich countries have raced ahead and have got the growth, the progress, the jobs and all that, while the developing countries, which are two-thirds of the world, are desperately trying to develop their own economies to bring the prosperity, to reduce the unemployment, to get those things. But you can't do it simply having business as usual. Because together, both the developing and developed countries will then produce a level of carbon that will damage irreparably the climate change. So that's the big change. And that's why the UN said the principle of common but differential responsibilities and respective capabilities. Each country is different. Even in the developing countries, their natures of their economy are quite different. So what you have to do is give a fair share of it, recognizing their development in the order of prosperity. So to secure the global consensus, due recognition of the needs of developing countries to secure economic growth and prosperity is required. The developing countries represent two-thirds, or 65% of the people on the planet, <coughs> suffering most of the greatest poverty, deprivation, and yet they're responsible for only 30% of the world's carbon emissions. That's where we are in these negotiations. Fairness and social justice demand that this issue be at the heart of an agreement. So there's an essential principle which I've always believed in. It's embodied in the UN negotiating principle for this, and it needs to be if you need consensus. Because if you don't get the agreement of the developing world and you don't get a global agreement, then you've got a global catastrophe that will come from climate change that we are warned, warned constantly about. But the difference is considerable and inevitable, right? But we need to have any fairness if we're to have a consensus agreement. Um, so the application of carbon and how you develop is a crucial matter. Developing countries quite rightly want to meet the demands for greater prosperity, more jobs and the reduction of poverty in their countries. This is related to the role of sustainable economic growth and criticism which are higher in their early stages of industrialization development. The UN Rio Conference of Climate Change recognize that two decades of progress has made the global sustainability of reducing po poverty and protecting the environment. So we must note, basically, that even environmental solutions cook environmental damage gases and will remain as agreed. I talked to you about some solutions we buy before may not be applicable 20 years later. There's a couple of examples of that. One I gave you of the diesel. Well, we were at Kyoto, we didn't consider the consequence of, we thought it was all carbon. So all the people moved from the petrol engines to diesel. Now we find that diesel's killing more people from the effects of the use of the diesel and the not chemical involved. The second one is, you may have heard about, was an international agreement which was agreed in 1987 which was the ozone layer, which is causing great damage to people. And we discovered then that the issue was, was the gases that were used in the refrigeration. And so we agreed something between the 12, 24 nations, 47 nations, and we were able now, as it's just been announced, we have closed that gap. And that's very important. But now they've come up and found that the new gas that we replaced in the refrigerator is now causing even greater problems in regard to air conditioning. And they're going to have to now talk about a new gas actually to go into air conditioning. Now when you start to go up developing countries, I suspect on the matter of air conditioning, it's pretty well used by most people. So any consequences that apply from that, which was right in 1987, is no longer right now in for the new circumstance. So here again, here's something that's going to affect the developing countries as well as the developed, and therefore we'll have to replace the gas. The point I want to make on that, whatever you agreed two years ago, is not necessarily, two decades ago, is not necessarily going to apply. So we have to always be thinking ahead of the consequences that come from changing gases in our mixes and the basket of gases we talk about on the effect of um, uh, economic growth. Now, I think that was uh, two important lessons. Uh, so in today, two decades, we need 30% more. But if you look at the demands now, we talk about carbon, we talk about diesel. But can I just remind you, in the next two decades, we'll need 30% more water, and you well know that here, 45% more energy, 50% more food, 
And economic growth is necessary, but it has to be low carbon green economy. We can't just say to you, I'm sorry you can't pursue the high carbon growth that we in the rich nations did. You've got to find a new way is moving to a new low carbon. That means a lot more thinking, a lot more agreement, a lot more idea, ideas and innovation to achieve that. So indeed, sustainable green growth demands a new model of economic growth which must be efficient. And really, that new model of economic growth is really the challenge for the next two decades of the, uh, of the climate change. I recognize that the green growth concept, which people talk about, is both strategic and, and, and analytical merit. It has a merit of turning a negative debate of what we'll do from gas, but a positive response to be given to move to green economy, to move the whole world from its high carbon growth to low carbon. But in that, of course, that developing countries will rightly demand that whilst we can't grow as fast, uh, can't, if we're going to have a share of carbon, it should be in a fairer way. And I would argue you have to have a greater share of a rational carbon or replace it with something else which doesn't damage their carbon, as it, the economy, as it does with carbon. Now, that's a major change, a different kind of model. It is based and has to be on the UN principle governing the concept of climate change with common but differential responsibilities and respective capability. That is absolutely right. Whether we observe it is yet a challenge to come. Common, namely that we all want to see a reduction of carbon. We accept what the, uh, what, what the scientists tell us about that and its effect on the weather. Differential responsibilities that we're all at different stages of our economic growth even within the developed uh, economies and the developing economies and our respective capabilities because at the end of the day some of you just basically are gathering economies perhaps there's not much you can do about they don't produce the same amount of carbon we need to work more what we were doing in the Kyoto agreements before was actually agreeing the global architecture to how you would deal with it setting a global figure but the reality is that we knew it at the time if we set and find a global agreement internationally it won't mean anything unless you can get the agreement lower down the line that if people can agree what that consensus is begin to move more to the green economy and to affect that change that is a really big challenge but that's what the nature of it is and therefore it requires in the coalition to develop technical financial legal solutions for greater energy efficiency the development of coal carbon you know, and coal could still be used if we could actually put the money into carbon sequestration. We know some of the scientific answers, but we avoid doing them. Why? Because the rich countries say it's too expensive, even in Britain. The rich countries can't afford not to actually take the technological and scientific changes that they can afford to pay to reduce their part of the carbon in the total agreement. And there's some of the things. Renewables is another source where we can agree. Here, of course, in Morocco, you're doing a share of the solar. I see now Siemens is very much involved with you, as it is indeed with us in Holland, my area. And they're the way forwards, if anything. So what the Paris Protocol really did was to say, look, on the new agreement, we agree that we should all have targets. Nationally, we didn't do what Britain did, put it into law to implement what we were given the targets, but they are saying to people, you, Morocco, United Kingdom, all countries must now accept a national target. And they all went away from Paris saying, great, we've now got an agreement for national targets. But unless you've got a policy to implement those national targets, you've got nothing. And we're marching on to a catastrophic situation if it continues to build CO2. So what it said, yes, we'll have targets. And you know, you, it said you've got to have policies. Now, do you know you in Morocco are going to be right at the center of this argument? You've now been told that it's your first conference of the parties, which they call the negotiations, is to be held here in Morocco in two weeks' time. And each government has got to turn up with a policy to show that that policy is how they will achieve the target. Expressing the target is one thing, Dealing with the policies to achieve it is quite another. And so the first start in getting the assessment of that next change comes here in Morocco. It couldn't come at a better time in a way, because I've been having a look at some of your Morocco policies, particularly when we look at what we do in our case in UK. Because what the top negotiations did was one thing. That's the architecture part. But it's how you knit those policies together. 
it's not just asking developing countries get on and change an economy it's about better cooperation between rich and poor uh, developed and undeveloped to look at the problems and say what can we learn from each other and I've been seeing some of it today in Morocco, Morocco this afternoon so here we're looking to see how can we combine together now the Europe is going to provide a hundred billion a year I must tell you it's not got to the hundred billion yet but that's what they're committed to that money is going to be available not by just giving it money to governments you know, governments have a tendency to spend the money, rich or poor, you know what I mean? Not necessarily on climate change. So what we've got to do now is to make sure that the money goes to those projects, like develop on the energy side or renewables or help to deal with agriculture, I'll come to that in a minute. But it helps you then to develop that first stage towards a green economy. And then it's the rich countries that have to find the 100 billion and then we're able to transfer to help the developing countries in their progress in march of industrialization which will require more carbon uh, the related economy to find common solutions to those problems and indeed that's what we've been working on how to achieve that low carbon and it's a bottom-up co cooperation really and i want to mention how we've been working on some of those things there is one other major change taking place but i will the United Nations, which is always used in the first global negotiations really, had set a target for the millennium on health, on education, on poverty, on employment, very worthy goals. I got to tell you, we didn't get it. It was all right, these international conferences, and they put their hands up, but if you don't get it, you're going to fail. So what the UN has done, it's had a climate change one, which we've just been talking about, and it's had these millennium goals. What they've done is put the two together. So any proposal must be as concerned about reducing unemployment, improving the poverty situations, those two. That's a kind of global architecture which the UN brought together. It's up to whether we can achieve it. The hundred billion pounds that we're talking about each year will be geared to that. So you give the money to those that help us reduce the carbon. And where we want it most is where you need carbon more to reduce your unemployment, to get the kind of wealth that the way the wealthy countries have done it. So that is the challenge for us. And I think what it does now, it's got a bottom-up cooperation. I want to finish on this point because I think this is what I hope the purpose of today is partly about. If you look at the Paris Agreement, it's a bottom-up national approach, calls on local and regional governments, cities and business to actually commit themselves to achieving the targets that the governments have done. And therefore, our northern regional contribution is to develop. First of all, the economies are so different in different areas. In our area, we're a rich country, we're a developed country, and we have an estuary called the Humber Estuary. It's not been developed too great a deal, but we're now we've got Siemens coming in, we've got the coal industry there, we've got chemicals. We are turning that now into an energy estuary. And we've done something else. We've said, why don't we ask you, this kind of economy we've got at the moment, why don't we find out what the environmental and low carbon is? So we've produced this report. We're the only country, in fact the only area, and the universities have come together to produce what they call the economies of low carbon cities. Most people are moving to cities. That's what the world population is doing in history. So how do we get them a lot less carbon? So we are measuring the carbon of the Humber. We're looking at the nature of the Humber estuary, and that's our contribution to try and get the local economy working very much to the idea of reducing carbon. It's an area of a million people. It has the Northern Universities, and universities in our north, working together to find these low carbon solutions in what is basically of being a high carbon and a rich country. So we need to develop, and we are trying now, that this economics of low carbon cities we're now trying to develop a robust model assessing the costs and benefits and the different levels. We've come down to the bottom. We've come down to the region. We use what's there as the targets and resources of national government. But we have a commitment now to develop our economy, but a low carbon one, changing the priorities that come in those areas. And we have developed a body now, and we're in the process of doing that, hopefully to achieve that, to get what we call a sustainable growth. The Humber Estuary is a low-carbon solution. Now that's the way we look at it in my area, from Paris. What are the Paris effects upon us? Now one interesting thing about Paris is that it... <coughs> what's it called? 
Prime Minister May. Oh, Prime Minister. I won't move any more from that. I can have a giggle about that anyway, though. If you look at Prime Minister May, she's now saying she doesn't think she can eat it, eh? Mexit. Mexit, Brexit, whatever it's bloody called. But if you look at Prime Minister, what she's done, she's saying, ah, we are an agreement to reduce uh, carbon by 80% by 2050. It's a little different from the Paris Agreement. We've gone further than the Paris Agreement. What she's now saying, and it's almost the first to down and stepping out of the European Union, we don't necessarily ratify what the European Union is doing in ratifying the Euro Agreement. Because she's saying we're doing it a different way. The different way to achieve that is an argument in our country, but it's what each country's got to do. You look at your own economy, like you will in Morocco, and say, how do we move from a business as usual. What is interesting, the Morocco target, which is now set, I think it's about a 40% cut, ours is about 80%. I like the use in that agreement where you say business as usual. You've taken a measurement of what the carbon is now and called it business as usual. And you've set you the target for 2030 by a 40% cut. Now that's very courageous, but it shows you whilst we might have a 80% target, the rich countries have got to cut more of carbon, basically, so it means that the developing countries can have a fairer share to be able to develop those economies. So whilst we, and indeed the Logistics Institute, we've had kind of Professor Amu who's with us today, and I'm working with them as well, and indeed we have David, so David Richards, who's our Vice Chancellor, Vice Chancellor Pro-Vice Chancellor, we get these titles well, at least from the University. Um, what we're doing there is to share, we want to share the technology. And we want to share the technology with the university here. So we begin to see two universities from a different part of the world representing the developed countries, representing the underdeveloped countries, working together to see what solutions we can have to achieve that. Now, interesting enough, we've got Siemens, who are a great movement, and we welcome that now big one of the off -site, off, uh, renewable sites, the off wind, off our area, it's the biggest in the world. It's where we're working with Siemens now to look at how we might develop the S3 and the economy. You've got Siemens, I think if it, I keep on there, but I must have said Tangiers, Tangiers is it, where, which is a port area. It's dealing with wind power. Now, they said in their report, and I read it just a few minutes ago, it said, we have learned a lot from the offshore wind industry's home. And therefore, they're working there, and they have learned to what they want to develop here. We have things we need to learn from you. But already we're beginning to see, in some areas on energy, we've got common efforts to be made, and the solutions are renewables, not more oil and gas. So in a way, we're working together on one of the energy solutions on Siemens. So I think here, of course, with the university here, to promote the logistics and supply chain logistics. Today I've been to, is it, uh, Sous Massé Dra, Richard, forget me, I'll tell you. You know the region. Oh, well. I've got the reports. <laughs> now this is a report that's been drawn up by the two universities and what we can do in Morocco. And it shows the abilities of using universities. Instead of them getting together with a drink of wine and sherry as they do in the UK sometimes, town and down it's called, they're beginning to use the brains after all, that's what we put them in the bloody universities to, to think about, isn't it? And they're beginning to do it in a way now which is very, very productive and absolutely essential. So already we've shown in this report here the greater sense of collaboration is to achieve the, how we might achieve these goals. So here, of course, um, Yeah, that was the research that went on with it. Anyway, when it comes here to the region we're talking about, we discovered we're well aware that the region is very important when it comes to agriculture. We've got quite a big agriculture sector now, but not as great as the one that you've got in the production of the products you do from agriculture. And I've been to a wonderful farm today. What, which one is it? None where I saw the pallets, the pigeons, the kangaroos and everything. <laughs> Some hotel. What was it? Shout it out for us. Oh, I've never got that one. <laughs> it's very good to go there. What became a tourist attraction is really dealing with what agriculture is about. It's supply chain in different ways, and I saw it today. And to see those wonderful oranges, I can't remember what the name is. The one that I was eating. What is it called? 
<laughs> you can see I'm well informed on these situations, can't you? So in that, what I did see, of course, that the, when it comes to agriculture, about 50% of the population work in this area. It has climate and permits around, uh, around production, <coughs> known to be the production of uh, vegetables, <coughs> uh, fruits and cereal. Now, water, however, is a precious commodity. And that is in all agricultures, right? And agriculture needs a lot of water, leaving farmers to have to tight the aquifers for yeah. irrigation. And uh, somebody told you didn't have rain, but I saw it this afternoon for about five minutes. I thought that was to welcome us to Morocco. We saw rain, you know. We got rain coming out of our ears. And the amount of water used in this region is about 5% drinking, industrial use, and 95% for irrigation and water deficit in 2016 was ex ex estimated to be 233 cubic meters. Now that's a phenomenal difference and growing and a deficiency in a critical thing for any country, whether it's developed or developing. And what you're being looking at how, and this report trying the two universities working together, how do we actually use water more efficiently to save produce the product which keeps the, job, the jobs and the prosperity? There are, I believe, 9,000 wells in the regions for the use of irrigation purposes. Some of them are something as 450, well, you know more of these five meters deep. The government's been giving subsidies only to farmers to move from their traditional water-intensive irrigation methods to more pressurized systems that save on water that require more energy for pumping out water. Our research found that in all farms were to be converted to the most efficient drip methods not only would water be saved, and I saw that today, in between those rows, I keep saying oranges, I don't know, fruit that was on the trees, I don't very nice to taste. But between the two sets of trees, you could see the channel where all the water was pumped down. Massive use of water in that situation, being taken out of the ground, because you don't have the rain, right? And you've got it onto pipes, using it more and more efficiently, and indeed, Deep producing the fruit is so necessary. And now I saw that little pipe running alongside, giving them a little bit of water from time to time. That was a better way of dealing with it. But when I realized and inquired, how do you get the water? Because you'll be going so deep down to the archivists, which are getting very stretched, to say the least. How can you actually change that? Well, if you use the less efficiency, better efficiency, you can use less water and still get the problem. That's a major change for it. But you do something else on carbon, it's all related. You pump it out using pumps, using diesel or fuels, whatever it is. If you change that to what you've got so much of, solar, and began to see that the heat and the energy use the pumps then to pump up the water, we begin to see how it's a connection right through the process of industrial. And that's what you're doing here, and that's what the two universities are putting forward a solution. I tell you, it's a lot cheaper than government having to pay subsidies out to actually do that way, to move on. So the challenge is how can you still produce, lead the level of uh, uh, prosperity, keep people in jobs, Reduce the amounts of down demand and the water rich carbon. It's a win-win, isn't it? It's better than when we got it for the energy to tell you use it more efficiently. You now got it in a complex way. And then on top of that, I go into the hotel, see those wonderful animals, nice hotel to go. It's become a tourist attraction as well as doing the agriculture. So in a way, if you can see this connection, that's the beauty of this report. It's the beauty of two universities working together to look at a problem, not just carbon. How do you get the reduction in the use of water? Producing food without the same amount of water. Resaving on carbon by using your natural sun in the renewables rather than simply just pumping it on engine. It's a win-win situation. It's what is determined by the country by the nature of their economy. And what we're saying is we're doing a similar thing with the Humber. It's a different economy. Yours is basically the agriculture one and how we get that. But don't forget the agriculture just go to spin us into all the industrial development. It's agriculture keeping for that. And so I would say to you in, in conclusion, I think that's a wonderful connection. I'm looking forward to universities can now work together more and give us answers like that. If people go, you go to these companies and say, well, who is it they're going to make? If you start connecting some of these things, it's not just supply industries, it's the whole nature of the economy being dealt with in a different way, which is low carbon green growth. And that's what it's really about. So, you know, one of the things that you have to remember in all this, of course, we all know that the history has taught us that in the 19th century, 
nations learn to produce on a massive scale. The whole developing countries produce, produce, produce for wealth, to reduce jobs. Then the 20th century, will nations learn to consume on a massive scale. We consume and put packages in God knows what, with no concern for what the effects on resources are, or even indeed carbon. But that was the dominance of the 20th century. What is the 21st century is going to have to learn to achieve sustainability and on a massive scale. We have only just talked about the word at the moment. But if we can interpret sustainability, being still producing your fruit, saving carbon, using less energy and developing, that's what the challenge of sustainability. To have growth, to provide jobs, to provide prosperity, but to be done in a different way. Sometimes called green economy, what is essential is, is sustainability. Now, really that's the real challenge. And we've only just begun to cooperate to secure that sustainability on such a massive scale. But here we are. Morocco has given us a good example of how committed to carbon, how they're going to be achieving it, and you'll have the whole world coming in in a couple of weeks. You tell them that story. You tell them it's possible. Even a basically agriculture economy can turn and be carbon and save an energy. That's the best place for it. Any questions or do I catch a taxi? Oh, sorry. <laughs>